So this is the first Sunday of Lent. We begin to gather our journey to the cross and the empty tomb this year through the story of the prophet Jonah. So Jonah is one of the books of the prophets, and prophetic books have certain set of features in common. One is that there's always a time stamp, a date, a, a king who is reigning, some way to know exactly when this book is taking place. So you can put the book in its historical context. You know what's happening. You know who's uh, ruling. Uh, the second is that prophetic books are filled with oracles, prophetic oracles, meaning the prophet is saying something like, thus says the Lord, this is what I think, this is what you should do, here is my judgment. And then the prophet delivers a message that's meant to challenge, correct, edify, or encourage the community. So most prophetic books are mostly these big, long prophetic oracles. Jonah is a little bit of a different prophetic book. There's no time stamp whatsoever. We have no idea when this is taking place. The other thing is that being a prophetic book, there's, there's no real prophecy in it. There's no real oracle going on. An oracle happens, but there's no real detail. And the oracle in the Hebrew is three words. It's mostly a story about a prophet. This is important to know because this indicates that Jonah is meant to be read a bit differently than the other prophetic books, or to read it as a myth, a timeless story, which is why there's no time stamp. If you put a time stamp on it, you're tempted to read it just in this context. Without the, con without the time stamp, it's a story that's timeless. Now, sometimes we say the word myth and we begin to think, oh, it's an untrue story. But myth doesn't mean untrue. Myths have deep truth, some of the deepest truth. We've been studying in 11-minute lessons about the difference between math truth and poem truth. You know, math truth is those things like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Engineers love math truth. It's all empirical. You have some set things, and we need math truth. But if you were to define a kiss with math truth, it's basically a definition of these two outside organs of flesh intermixing saliva and pressing together, and it's gross. And on Valentine's Day, you don't want to define a kiss like that, do you? It's, it's, it's correct with math truth. It's a correct definition. But is it really a true definition? A kiss is so much more than that, isn't it? The best way to describe it sometimes is more poetically. It may not be scientific fact, but it's very true, isn't it? Math truth and poem truth. See, Jonah isn't supposed to be part of a history class curriculum with dates and times and names and specific events. It's a story meant to instruct, inspire, and challenge by carrying the truth of God, much like Jesus used parables. There's something deeper happening here that should engage us deeper than fleeing prophets and wicked cities and giant fish. Just as there's something deeper in Jesus' parables than seeds sown in different soil, forgiving kings, wicked tenants, and prodigal sons. But have you noticed, I don't know if you've noticed or uh, studied much Jonah in church, but often Jonah is reserved for children's Sunday school and vacation Bible school. I remember as a child, uh, when I was in third grade, our vacation Bible school was Jonah. And the logo was this giant whale with really big eyes that really are bigger than the face should be. You know how cartoons sometimes have these giant eyes? It's this cute, childish whale. And we sing silly songs about Jonah. It becomes a children's story for children's Bibles and videos with talking vegetables. Why is it that certain biblical stories endure in our faith primarily as, as children's stories? Frederick Beacon, our Presbyterian uh, pastor, offers us an interesting perspective in his book, The Hungering Dark. He says, not, I suspect, because children particularly want to read them, but more because their elders particularly do not want to read them, or at least do not want to read them for what they actually say. And so they make them instead into fairy tales, which no one has to take seriously. But for all our stratagems, the legends, the myth, continue to embody truths or intuitions, which in the long run it is perhaps more dangerous to evade than to confront. The children's author, Madeline Lingle, who wrote the series that A Wrinkle in Time is a part of, once said, if you really want to say something true and challenging, write a children's book. Because sometimes you can get those truths in to a children's story where you can't, and to adults, because we don't always want to hear them. 
the original fairy tales, like the Grimm's fairy tales, if you've ever read any of them, they're not quite like the Disney version, are they? And then, you know, ravens come and they pluck out the eyes of the wicked stepsisters and all this stuff. And we didn't like that as adults, because as adults, we realize that sometimes we're in the wrong, and we don't like the idea of justice so much. As children, they're like, oh, yeah, they should get what they deserve. So Disney and other places, they kind of soften the story so you don't have birds eating out inner organs and that kind of stuff because it's kind of scary. Not so much for the children, but for us. So we don't like to read Jonah as adults. Another possibility is that we give them the children because these stories ask us to believe the impossible. Maybe children are the keepers of these stories because they are the only ones with the imagination capable of handling the truth. For God, even the impossible is possible. And God is looking for people who will partner with God in making the impossible possible. I think it's a good definition of church. God partnering with people to make the impossible possible. God is looking to partner with his prophet Jonah to do the impossible, but Jonah has lost his childlike wonder and faith. So we pick up the story in Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So the word of God, a message of God from God, comes to Jonah, one of God's prophets, means God's messengers, to deliver. But Jonah says, you know what? I'm good. No thanks. And he runs away to Tarshish. That's a weird word to say, Tarshish. Try saying it five times fast. I will not do that right now. For Jonah, nothing could be more impossible than being sent to Nineveh. See, Jonah is a Hebrew prophet, an Israelite, a Jew, and Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, a powerful neighboring nation with a long history of brutality, war, and conquest. In fact, in 722 uh, BC, Assyria crushed the northern kingdom of Israel, sending its people into exile and wiping it off the map forever. The Assyrians are the enemy. They are the very ones threatening God's people. Nineveh is a dark, wicked place. As a Jew, you hated Assyria, and thus you hated Nineveh, which is at the very heart of the beast itself. And yet God tells Jonah, go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. What's interesting is in Hebrew, this passage can be translated a little differently. You could translate it, go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out concerning it, for its wickedness has come up before my face. God isn't just sending Jonah to cry out against Nineveh. God is sending Jonah to cry out concerning Nineveh. God looks to Nineveh, the dark, wicked city, and is concerned for it. Now, the original crowd reading this would have thought, Wouldn't have thought like, oh, bad Jonah for disobeying God. That's how we read it now. We think there's a prophet of God who's disobeying the Lord. But the early Jews would have been like, yeah, Jonah, don't go to Nineveh. Nineveh's horrible. You want to not go to Nineveh. They would have been cheering them, being like, yeah, go, Jonah, don't go to Nineveh. They're the worst. For God to send Jonah to Nineveh would be like God telling a present-day Jewish rabbi, go to Tehran, that great city, and cry out concerning it. Or to a South Korean pastor, go to Pyongyang, that great city, and cry out concerning it. Or maybe an American pastor right out of 9-11, go into the heart of Afghanistan and the Taliban country and cry out concerning it. Because I'm concerned for the Taliban there. We'd have been like, no, don't go there. Why would you want to go there? Why would you want to go to Nineveh? This seems like an unthinkable task to Jonah, requiring him to believe that God's love extends even to the enemy, to the worst enemy. That's impossible for Jonah. God is concerned for for ISIS. God is concerned for for Voldemort. I know know Megan McKeegan likes the Voldemort references. 
God's concern for that meth house, that gang den, that's, that's impossible. God can't worry so much about that. God can't want us to go there. That's not God, is it? But God is concerned about what happens in the darkest corners of the earth. And God sends people to be God's people, to be God's presence in those dark places. God wants to send us. Go at once to what would be the most unimaginable and unthinkable place I could name for you. If I were to say, I want you to go to, where would you be thinking, please not this, please not this? Do you remember in school when you were getting assigned teachers sometimes? You're like, please not Dr. Bates, please not Dr. Bates. Or please don't call on me. If I were to say, go to, where's the one place you wouldn't want to go? Is it a place somewhere in the world? Some place where Boko Haram is harassing people in Africa? Is it a place in downtown Peoria where you wouldn't want to go at night? Or is it a place that's more metaphorical? You don't want to go where there's conflict. You don't want to go where there's tension. You don't want to go into your own past because you want it buried. Where would you not want to go? Where do you consider it to be too dark for you to wander into? Whatever you thought of, that's probably the place God actually wants you to go. And that's a little scary. It's a little uncomfortable. So immediately, without hesitation, Jonah arises as he's been commanded, but he doesn't go to Nineveh. Instead, he takes off for the Mediterranean coast to catch the first ship headed to Tarshish. So Nineveh is located in present-day Iraq. So a Google map, you see Nineveh there. Joppa is down on the Israeli coast, and Tarshish is at southern Spain. At the other end of Jonah's world, the Mediterranean was basically the world at that time. He wants to go to the far end of the world. That's how much he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He will cross to the other side of the known world. See, not only is Tarshish about as far as Jonah can get from Nineveh, it's an escape, and it seems there's no price Jonah isn't willing to pay to escape. Most of us know the way to Tarshish. Like Jonah, we've paid the fare at one point or another. The escape to Tarshish for some people takes the form of shopping, where the temporary fascination with something new takes your mind off the darkness, off Nineveh. For others, there is the workplace. Going to work or bringing work home keeps them from having to ever really be home. Others retreat inside. They escape by isolating themselves from everyone around them, keeping everyone at arm's length. Some fill their lives with busyness to ignore their inner dissatisfaction with their life. Some escape in pornography, a sense of intimacy without strings. Tarshish is all around us, and we go there often. Jonah thinks he can escape. We think we can escape. Whenever a word or phrase is repeated in Scripture... It usually means it's important. And in these three verses, these three short verses, Tarshish is repeated three times. And from the presence of the Lord is repeated twice. The storyteller wants us to know that Tarshish and the presence of the Lord are tied together. See, in Jacob's worldview, there's a place he can go to escape from God that won't have God in it. When you want to get away from God, you go to Tarshish. Now, this is one of those times in the book of John that's supposed to be funny, but since you're not laughing yet, you might need some background information. So Tarshish was known to be a beautiful paradise. Think of it as we would like Hawaii, Tahiti, Fiji. Anyone want to be in Hawaii today? Or Fiji? Jamaica? That sounds pretty nice, right? Especially in the heart of winter when we're not sure spring's ever going to come again. So Jonah is pretty convinced the best way to get away from the creator of the universe is to go to a place where the creation is on display in amazing ways. How many of us would say, man, I just need to get away from God for a bit. I need to go to Hawaii and just bask in the lush beauty of creation. That will help me forget about God for a while. Help me forget about the creator to be in paradise. It's supposed to be fun. It was fun. I think it still kind of is. 
So Tarshish is this geographical symbol for the absence of God in paradise. The other geographical symbol is Nineveh. Nineveh is described as a wicked and dark city in complete contrast to the lush paradise of Tarshish. But Nineveh has something Tarshish apparently doesn't have. The presence of God. Now we know God is present everywhere. Psalm 139 asks, where can I flee from your presence? Not even Tarshish. But suppose we believe there were places you could flee from the presence of God. Would you think it'd be Maui or the red light district of Amsterdam? <laughs> See, this story reverses it. You want to flee to God, you go to paradise. See, the world doesn't need more people to go to Hawaii, I'm sorry. It needs people who go to Nineveh. God is inviting us to embrace the darkness, both of our own shadows and the shadows in the world around us. So here's the troubling truth this children's story confronts us with that we don't want to actually be confronted with. If you want to find God, then don't go to church first. Look in the dark, shadowy back alleys of the soul and the world, the parts of ourselves that we repress, deny, and disown that we are frightened of. In that dark back corner room with locked door, if you were to go, and open that door you would find, nestled in among the sin and the shame and the darkness and the sickness and the sorrow, you would find there the creator of the universe, reclined and relaxed, completely at home, not the least bit offended, not the least bit surprised. It's a fascinating phenomenon that the divine dwells in the darkest places. It shouldn't surprise us, though, we find Jesus eating with sinners reclining at their table. In our darkest moments, that's when we need God most, right? I mean, it shouldn't surprise us that a God who we affirm is to be with us and for us would first be where we need God most, in the darkness. You will always find God in the darkness, in the wickedness, in the broken cracks and crevices of the world. Those dark places come up before God's face and God is concerned about them, concerned about you, concerned about us. God wants to meet you in Nineveh, and in that seemingly impossible place, God wants to change everything. <coughs> Jonah's story, Lent, reminds us that we experience the light of God most powerfully in the dark. When you turn on a flashlight in the light of day, you can't even tell it's on. Turn on your headlights in the daytime, it does nothing for you, does it? It actually makes your dashboard lights where you can't actually read them, and it makes it very annoying. Turn on your lights in the daytime, it's actually a hindrance sometimes. But if you're in a dark room, or you're on a back country road in the middle of nowhere, in the pitch black dark, you're handed a flashlight, you turn on your car headlights, well, that's everything to you. It's everything. In the light of Tarshish, it's easy to miss. It's easy to overlook. You think you don't even need it. But in the darkness of Nineveh, it's your salvation. It's your everything. If that's the case, why do we run from the dark? The Hebrew phrase used to describe Jonah's running is me lifne. It suggests a rupture of contact, a turning of one's back. It means flat-out rebellion, just fleeing. Jonah runs because he thinks he knows better than God about how the world ought to work. And as far as Jonah's concerned, those people in Nineveh don't deserve a warning. They deserve destruction. The only thing God ought to be concerned about Nineveh is destroying them once and for all. In a way, Jonah's running is about control. Did you ever do that? You detach from someone as a way to control them. I remember my best friend at elementary school, T.J. Walsh. He lived across the street from me. We had an argument, as children friends are prone to do. So I thought, you know, the best way to show him and control this, I just won't go over his house anymore. I won't say a word to him until he comes back to me and apologizes. Then I have the power in that relationship. I'm going to withdraw because I'm going to control him that way. Have you ever done that? Ever had someone do that to you? You flee. 
You separate as a way to control. Jonah's doing this to God. I'm going to run from you because I'm not going to do what you want. That way I get to do what I want. I'm going to play by my own rules here. And if I go, guess you can't worry about Nineveh because I'm your only way to tell them that they're in trouble. It's kind of conceited a little bit, isn't it? So Jonah settles in for the long journey to Tarshish. He appears to have everything under control. His plan is working, but there are clouds in the distance. Tarshish or Nineveh? That was Jonah's choice. And it's our choice here at the beginning of Lent. So two questions to ponder this week. The first, what is your Tarshish? Tarshish in this passage is a symbol of escape. It's the eject button for Jonah to get away from the darkness. What is your version of the escape? We all have it. Is it drugs, sex, power, eating, a relationship, a game, a religion, a book, exercise, traveling? Now notice this list. A lot of them aren't bad things. Tarshish is not a bad place. It's a beautiful place. I would like to go to Tarshish right now. The problem is not Tarshish. The problem is how Jonah was using Tarshish. The question to ask is, if my Tarshish is exercise, am I using it that to escape from reality, or am I using it to bring me back and usher me into ultimate reality? It depends on how it's used. What is your Tarshish? What do you use to escape from the darkness the divine dwells? Think about that. This week, name it. What's your escape from the darkness that you don't want to have to confront? What do you do to make where you don't have to think about it? You don't have to deal with it. You don't have to go to it. Because there's darkness all around us. We all have it in our lives. What's your escape? The second question then is, are you aware of your Nineveh? Nineveh on this passage is a symbol of darkness, darkness of all kinds, the darkness of sin, of something hidden that you're ashamed of, the darkness of grief, something you lost or are losing. Are you aware of your Nineveh? Are you willing to open the door to it and name it? See, here's the thing. The point is not to get in there and fix it. That's not what God commanded Jonah to do. God did not say, I need you to go to Nineveh and fix the problem. What God said is, I want you to go to Nineveh and just tell them to name it. Name their pain. Your only task is to name that pain. You bring it into awareness. Learn to welcome it, the things that we've disowned, denied, and repressed. Allow them to come up to the surface. Because when they do, they become exposed to God's radiant light and love. And what you'll find, the most strange phenomenon of all, is that when you go to your Nineveh, you will go to the place that God dwells most comfortably. The place you're most saying, I don't want to go. The place you're most uncomfortable being at, when you name it, and you go there, that's where God is most comfortably. So for this season of Lent, I pray and I hope we will acknowledge our Tarshish, our methods of escape, that we will make our journey to our Nineveh, the place of darkness where the divine dwells. And when you go there, you may just experience the light that is boundless, effortless, and always available to be your salvation. Let us pray together.